Hi, good afternoon. We're going to try to make this a little like a lightning round because votes just got called in Congress. Three. It, it happens. They actually do do something every so often. Thank well, let's not exaggerate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you all know Debbie's the, um, I call her Debbie because I met her when I was in law school. So we've known yeah. each other a long time. A long time. I won't say exactly how long. So 12th District of Michigan. Uh, before that, you were chair of the Wayne State University Board of Governors. So why don't we cut? President of the GM Foundation and co-founder of the Race for the Cure in Michigan and DC. So end of bio. I think we know enough. So I see a lot of jocks in this room. So I wanted to ask you, you have two uh, big teams in Michigan, uh, pro teams in Michigan. Uh, Donald Trump took a stick and hit a tender spot um, for all of us uh, with his comments about um, uh, athletes taking uh, the knee during the anthem. I assume you know the owners of the Pistons and uh, is it the Lions? That exhausts my sports knowledge. We actually have uh, the Detroit Tigers, which traded Justin Verlander and I haven't recovered. Uh, the Detroit Lions, and I w would like to say that this is, I was so outraged on Sunday, I posted on my site about, Sunday's supposed to be a day of rest. You can tell I'm a Catholic girl, as is Margaret. And instead of something that's supposed to, in some way, pulls communities together, he further divided us. And when I was in high school, I don't know, it was, may have been eighth grade, Mother Harmon, I'm a product of the nuns. And I love to debate, I am a product of the nuns, I'm proud of it. I said, we should have a law that bans the burning of the flag. And they taught me then. I love the flag. Anybody who's been to my office knows it's part of my decor, it's part of my home decor. I still cry when I sing the national anthem. But more important than that, and Mother Harmon taught me this, is that I live in a country that gives every person the right to say what they think, and if they want to burn the flag, we are not going to put them in jail for freedom of speech. Mm. And I knew, uh, the Detroit Lions is actually owned by a 92-year-old woman, Martha Ford, who is this just fabulous, tenacious, um, I remember... Is she, she going to take a knee? She, on Sunday, was on the field, arm in oh. arm, hey. and the young gentleman that sang the national anthem then got down on his knee, and the team stood together. And that's what happened across America. It's a oh. stupid, senseless fight, and I wish he wasn't picking it. And when a 92-year-old woman is standing up, on all the teams in yeah. Michigan, Detroit Pistons, the Red Wings, oh. sports is the yeah. only thing right. we're really happy about. So we're going to leave. We're, we're going to leave the Church of Sports and go to um, uh, you, Michigan, and the presidential race and Hillary Clinton. Uh, I want to quote something back to you. Um, you thought I was not. Deborah said, "Quote: It infuriated me that Clinton and her team didn't show up until the weekend before the primary. This is the Michigan primary, when it suddenly became clear they had a problem." I took Bill Clinton grocery shopping that Saturday, too little, way too late. First, what did you mean by taking Bill Clinton grocery shopping? <laughs> and secondly, did, did, they li did they listen to you at all, or was it just, they listened to you but it was too late, or they didn't listen to you? The, nobody listened, and no offense to people in the media, you know, even you and Steve all thought I was crazy. I kept telling people that Michigan was competitive. And you know what, if you've got, um, you know, every weekend I make a point of going into a union hall. I get around my district. I frequently will do 10 events a day. Uh, when I went, they called me. I, Bernie Sanders had been in my district 10 times. He had been at Local 600, which is the biggest UAW local in the country. He had been at Eastern University. He had been, came to the Dearborn Performing Arts Center with the Muslim community. He had been everywhere. Hillary Clinton never walked in my district. And by the way, when you look at voter turnout for primary and uh, general, my district had a larger turnout than one of the Detroit districts did. Um, so they called me at like 9 o'clock on Friday and said, will you take <laughs> Bill Clinton to a grocery store? I said, this is a joke, right? But it actually was fun to grocery shop with Bill Clinton. He's very good grocery shopping, and he's gotten healthy, which I'm not. <laughs> but... Um, 
it, it, it just, I was very frustrated in both the primary and the general election. I think they took the Midwest for granted, uh, and you saw the result. So <clears throat> on this listening question, listening to women, uh, last two weeks ago when Chuck and Nancy had crispy beef with Trump in the White House, uh, Leader Pelosi said afterwards, or it was reported that she said during the dinner, are, are you listening, can, can I be heard, are you listening to me? Do you find that in, your, uh, in the midst of Congress? Do uh, women, for instance, Senator Kamala Harris during the hearing when Richard Burr more or less told her to be quiet, um, do women get heard when the doors are closed, when we don't see you? I think it depends who you are, and wh well, not even where you are. I think that I've been lucky that in Michigan, I've had, I'm a newbie member of Congress, but I've been active in Michigan for decades. And I've been on many boards, and I actually think the unions were listening to me and respected me, and that that, I think that the, what we saw in the Clinton campaign wasn't just, me. by the way, it was a woman that wasn't listening. They were trusting a <laughs> right. metric that... That really hurts, a woman not listening to another woman. Um, I, Bill Clinton got it. I mean, Bill Clinton said to me the weekend before the election, you've been right this entire election. And I, you know, one of the, I knew the staff was scared to death on primary that I was going to tell Bill Clinton exactly what I thought. And I'm professional enough to know you don't get the candidate spouse riled up as you're going into an election. So I didn't tell him what I was um, thinking. But I do think that depending, I have been more surprised in Congress at how women have to work harder to be heard. I actually found myself, I, look, I can tell you stories. Um, you have to earn your place. I, I mean, I remember when I interviewed for my job at General Motors, I was asked why would a woman want to work at General Motors? And Mary Barra, who has been my friend and colleague for 30 years, is now the CEO of General Motors. I watched a male chauvinistic industry change, though it's still the last of the male bastions, even with Mary, um, as a CEO. But I, I think it depends where you are and who you're with as to whether you get listened to or not, and that we have to be careful in the way that we try to get ourselves heard, because I think it's far easier to roll your eyes and ignore women than it is the men. So, <clears throat> have you read What Happened? I have. Um, uh, did you read the part? I read it the first night it was out. I stayed up all night. Oh, wow. What did you think? Let me just open it up entirely. Because there was a part in there where Hillary Clinton is taking a nap on election day because it's so cooked. Um, I was t nervous and scared, and I think that there, look, I have, I've talked to her since the election, and I think she is right about many things. I think that we should be more concerned about Rus what Russia is doing in this country. And although I have said, I said to my colleagues in April and May, when everybody was high-fiving because the special counsel had been appointed uh, for Russia, that people in my district aren't talking about Russia. They're talking about jobs and how the auto industry, who's had a successful decade, is now having projections of downturns and they're worried about what's going to happen to their job. But do I think we need to be worried about Russia? Yes. Are we? We're not paying enough attention. I think she's right that as Democrats, we're not organized well on social media, that the conservatives are far better organized and you know, are paying people to troll, that we have not learned how to communicate with people on social media. But I also think that we underestimate, and I, it's not, you know, everybody then wants to call it the white male. I keep telling people, first of all, I get furious when people say all Trump voters are racist. They're not. Um, people are scared. We need to understand economic anxiety. I was having an intense discussion with one of my colleagues who Mark Pocan from Wisconsin was there, and I was trying to explain, so I said coastal elites, and she took great offense, she's from Massachusetts, she hated the word, and she said, how would you like to be called a Midwest imbecile? And I said, I am, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and then I threw in redneck, you know, southern rednecks. We've gotta not label people, but we need to start to put ourselves in other people's shoes more, and understand how people feel. 
And we really need to understand that there are a lot of people in America that are worried, have economic anxiety. And I think she did not understand that. Um, do, the, do the other do Democrats that are poised to run uh, for president, are they going to get, get a, the kind of message and the understanding of the union folks, the, the people that you know in Michigan, that allows them to speak to those people? I mean, one criticism of Hillary Clinton was that she had the right prescriptions, but she didn't know how to talk them. Of course, she was running against a reality star who had a shtick for them. But nonetheless, she couldn't really talk to them. It sounds to me like you know how to talk to them because you've been in Michigan. But if you were to distill the problem, it's that there are coastal elites it's the party of, you know, Katy Perry and Caitlyn Jenner, but it's not the party of that guy in Michigan who used to make a really good living and have a boat to go to on the weekends, who doesn't have that anymore, and, and Democrats it's, don't it's, know him. It's even more basic than that. So I, I've got the largest group of Teamsters in the country. They worked a lifetime. They paid their money into their pension. They thought they'd have a secure retirement. And suddenly, they're threatening to cut their retirement by 70%. People, the salaried side of the auto workers, everybody thought you worked hard, you'd play by the rules, you'd have health care when you retired at 65. If you're a salaried employee in the auto industry, any of the domestic OEMs, your health care is gone at 65. You got Medicare. That's it. You got to go buy a supplemental. People don't understand. If you, I came from an area, Look, I worked for General Motors for three decades. You thought if, you know, you went to work for a company, you worked hard, you stayed loyal, you'd have a secure retirement. Then the bankruptcy came in 2007 and 2008. People have not forgotten that anxiety in their heart and their soul. And that, is that economic anxiety. So, yes, we saved the domestic auto industry. Had the domestic auto industry collapsed, we have no idea the kind of depression that would have hit this country. But people didn't translate it into them. Workers weren't seeing any kind of increase in their wages. They're scared that there's going to be a bad trade deal. We had TPP sitting there, and they, were, they had seen uh, the North America Free Trade Agreement ship more than a million jobs overseas. Jobs disappeared. We were building 10 new car fa factories in, in Mexico. They're scared, and people never translated that. They didn't understand. And people haven't forgotten that economic fear in their hearts and souls a decade later. And Donald Trump came into Michigan and went to other states, went to Ohio, went to Pennsylvania, went to Wisconsin, and showed an empathy that we have better learn how to show again. So he's not going to deliver, but he showed that he got it. He understood. He's somebody that listens. And that's what Democrats have to do. Learn how to show that empathy and understand how people are feeling. So I have a sexist question for you. <laughs> and by the way, you should get that, me you should take that message outside of Michigan so that I do. Um, it, it can Is be Is my heard. staff having a heart attack? My yeah. staff's having a heart attack. <laughs> oh, no, he, he heard I was gonna ask you a sexist question, so he's gonna- That's right, do it fast. There's a vote. Um, you had to establish your, your own self after um, uh, John Dingell, after, at 88 years and after 60 years in the Congress, longest serving member, retired. How did you do that? Or were you, you were already established, certainly, uh, but it, you do not have that aura of the person who's you know, running just because their husband was there. So, and nobody ever says, did John Dingell stay in Congress so long because he had a wife that got it? You know, it's a, I would say, you know, I always sort of want to say that we were a p partnership, but I think many people don't understand that I was a senior executive in Michigan, that I, I was on, I started boards. I brought business, labor, and government into the only group that was back there, but I knew I wouldn't allow John Dingell to campaign with me. And I knew I had to stand on my own two feet. And I had to, and I, you know, but for a while I ran away from being a spouse. I ran away from, I am who I am. I am Debbie Dingle. And I'm married to a great man. And by the way, being a spouse makes me stronger. That double role I played, instead of, 
always be, we, women are problem solvers. Women are, no offense to the men in the room, but we end up bouncing more balls in the air. And we know we've got to, so the fact that, yes, I'm doing pu public policy and I've had a three decade career, but I still have to do the laundry, the grocery shopping, make sure that there's food there, get John to the doctor, uh, get my dry cleaning in, get the bills paid every week and go to Michigan every and weekend. fight with health insurance every week and you know Medicare keeps me real and you understand the frustration and the anger that's out there because I spent 14 hours trying to fight with Blue Cross and Blue Shield and Medicare as to who was the primary payer do a little more living you understand how people feel out there oh. so all right. We were going to have Steve's questions, gonna... but we can't have questions. I'm I apologize. Gonna... There's, there's a vote. There's a call for Three a vote. of them. And you, ca you cannot miss. I'm okay. sorry. I love being with you. <laughs> Thanks, Debbie.